have your Bible tonight and you would please take it out and open it to John chapter 10. The Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by the Apostle John chapter 10. Beginning at verse 7. Amen. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. And I would ask everyone if we would stand tonight in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the Word of the Lord reads in this fashion, John chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. All that ever, uh, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep, uh, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these things. And many of them said, He hath a devil, and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a man, uh, can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Amen. It may seem like a little bit unusual a text this morning, but I will tell you why I read that entire portion. I did not simply want to read to you of the controversy surrounding what the Lord had said without first reading to you the simplicity of what he had said really wasn't that complex uh, a dissertation he was giving on the shepherd and the sheep and so on and so forth. And yet when he was done with that beautiful message, the shepherd and the sheep, there were still those who said, oh, this man has the devil. This guy's crazy. He's mad out of his mind. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me this evening as I endeavor to bring forth a message God's laid upon my heart. Master, once again, in the wonderful, lovely name of Jesus, that name that is above every name that is mentioned in heaven and in earth, tonight, O oh God, we come before you, a people that needs more than anything in this world, even more than the next breath, we need to hear from you. And Lord, we have come into this place tonight with a desire to hear from heaven, to be fed that manna which is provided by you and you alone, and Lord, as we endeavor to break forth the bread of life, we ask you, O oh God, to anoint the lips of the speaker. God, allow me to speak plainly and freely that which you have delivered to my spirit, that you would desire that these people in this place and those that might watch or hear this message, Lord, that you would desire they receive. Anoint every word. Allow me, O oh God, to speak in boldness and yet with love. For, Master, we need so desperately for the Word of God to bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives, that we might glorify you in our daily living, a testimony of your grace and your love and your mercy. For we ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. And the church said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated. 
Every single great defense attorney that's ever walked the face of planet Earth knows, at least in America, there's a very valuable technique available to them. There's a very valuable tactic available to them when the facts cannot be altered and when the facts cannot be disputed in and of themselves then there's another logical step that they know to go in a trial in order to get their client off the hook. And that next logical step is to discredit the witness. You see, if I can make the witness look like a boob, then anything he says suddenly has no value. Now that witness may be telling the absolute truth. That witness may be saying exactly what they saw, exactly what they heard, exactly what happened, but if I can make that witness look bad, everything they said goes out the window in the minds of the jury. Amen. Discrediting the witness. I want to talk tonight about the credibility factor. Amen. You know, in the O.J. Simpson trial, and I'm not about to even get into the, the content of that whole thing, uh, don't want to get into the controversy of all that. In the O.J. Simpson trial, you see the, the most damaging evidence presented was by a detective by the name of Mark Furman. And oh boy, Mark Furman's the one who found the evidence, it seems, that would most pinpoint O.J. Simpson as the potential murderer of Nicole Brown Simpson and her male friend. For he found, as it were, uh, or supposed to have found allegedly, the bloody glove behind the house, right? But you see, old Johnny Cochran, he's no fool. He's been in this game a long time. And he knew before they ever went to trial that what he simply needed to do was find a way to make Furman look as foul as you can. And that way, anything he says goes right out the window. The jury won't want to hear it. They're not, they're not going to want to know about it. And not only sometimes do you look for anything, but sometimes you'll look for specific things because you know your audience. You know the jury. Now, if I've got a jury that's predominantly black, then I know, obviously, if I cough up something in this person's past that's racist and what have you, that uh, that's obviously going to offend the sensitivities of the jury. Right? If I have a jury that's predominantly Jewish and I am able to scrape up something in this man's past that is anti-Semitic, then I'm going to be able to work on the sensibilities of the jury. And in the case of the O.J. Simpson trial, you know how that worked. And I'm not going to go into all that, but the race card and Mark Furman was said to have uh, engaged in some rather racy, racist comments in the past and made some racist statements and blah 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 and therefore his testimony was invalid because why because he's a racist you know he might have been up to, to trying to frame OJ in this whole thing so you see sometimes the best way in people's mind to ignore the message is to discredit the messenger when Jesus Christ was walking the face of planet earth things were no different they heard what he had to say, but they didn't much like it. And because they didn't like it, the standard tactic and technique was, let us somehow break down the messenger. Let's label him a demoniac. Let's label him mad. Let's say he's crazy. Because if we can uh, put this label on him and make it stick, nobody will listen to what he has to say. Amen. My, my, my. You know how many folks out there tonight want to believe that Brother Morris is crazy as a loon? You know how many folks out there tonight want to believe that I belong in a mental institution? And it's not because of any observation they think, it's because of the message that I preach, amen. It hasn't got anything to do with what they've seen or what they've heard outside of the pulpit. They don't like the message, and therefore it's their obligation and their job and their might to tear down the messenger. Amen. People who think they want to be in ministry, I say, honey, you better think twice. Because there is nobody in this world, there is nobody in the church that stands on the front lines and puts themselves in right at, you know, the center of the devil's bullseye more than the preacher. Because he's the bearer of the message. And the bearer of the message is the one that's going to be torn down because if I can discredit the messenger, I have discredited the message.
advantage. You hear what I'm saying tonight? Amen. It's all about credibility. You see, in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 53, I want to read something to you on this subject matter. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 53. The Word of God said, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, When? Hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, my Roman Catholic friend, and his brethren, that means his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Amen. You see, when Jesus was outside of his home turf, people just said, oh, he's crazy. This man's mad. This man's a demoniac. But when he was on his home turf, when he was amongst his brethren and his own people and his own, you know, the old neighborhood, as they say, all of a sudden, the discrediting tactic still was employed, but now it's approached slightly different. Well, wait a minute. We know his mother. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. We know his family. This ain't anybody special. Where does he get all this wisdom from? Where does he get all this knowledge from? You know what cracks me up about so many in the high churches? They put so much emphasis and so much importance on going to seminary and learning about God and learning about the Bible through a seminary. And I've said a thousand times, honey, you can pick whatever seminary you want to go and they're each going to teach you what they want you to be taught. Amen. Amen. You don't learn the Word of God in seminary. You don't learn the truth in seminary. I don't care if it's a UPC seminary. I don't care if it's a PHW seminary. You do not learn the truth by going somewhere where people have it nicely packaged and tightly wrapped and taped on every corner with a nice big bow on it. Honey, that is not how truth is attained. Truth is attained when you take off your gloves and you get in the dirt and you dig it up for yourself Amen. and you allow the Holy Ghost from heaven to lead you into the depths of all truth. Because when God has shown you the truth, the Bible said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And there's not a demon in hell that can dislodge you from the truth of God when God has led you into that truth. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. You let a preacher or let a seminary lead you, they'll lead you every which way but upside down. And 20 years from now, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost finally hits you square in the eyeball, and you're sitting in a church where an ignorant and unlearned preacher is, who doesn't know his backslide from a hole in the ground when it comes to formal education, but he knows how to make himself available to the Holy Ghost from heaven to share and disseminate the Word of God with boldness and power and anointing, and all of a sudden you find yourself in the altar of repentance, converting from that old religious system you once knew to a truth that is liberating Amen. and free. Hallelujah. I've seen it happen enough. I know it goes on. Because what you learn in seminary is not the truth. You want the truth, you need to search it out. You need to dig it out. So many people in our communities tonight are away from God and away from the church because they've allowed somebody to come along and tell them that God hates the homosexual. God hates those who do not behave in a manner that he deems to be appropriate and he deems to be holy and he deems to be proper and uh, sinless and perfect. And they have allowed preachers to tell them things. And they have stepped away from God's fellowship because of what they've been told. And sadly enough, if they would have invested just a day, just a few hours in the Word of God for themselves and looked at some of these issues and looked at some of these scriptures Amen. and looked at some of this theology for themselves, God himself by the Holy Ghost would have led them right into the truth of the liberating gospel of grace and love. And they would have realized that there is not a thing in the world you can be. There is not a thing in the world you can do. There is not a place in the world. 
church around here if it kills me. My Lord, amen. I'm here to tell you the credibility factor is so important. And in this world, it's so easy for people to feel comfortable attacking a man's credibility. You look at the average presidential campaign, and it is fraught with all kinds of accusations. It is fraught with all kinds of exposés. Why, George W. Bush did cocaine when he was in college. I don't care if he did it yesterday, as long as he doesn't do it once he gets in the White House. Amen. But you see, they're, they're, if they don't like your message, do they tear the message apart? No. Sometimes they can't. Why? Because the message is true. Amen. If I wanted to get into politics, which I don't, I could go into some of the issues in our present-day political campaigns, everything from abortion, the death penalty, uh, welfare reform, campaign finance reform. You're going to tell me that some of what these candidates aren't saying on some of these issues isn't true? Certainly it is. But when the opponent doesn't like what they're saying on that issue, they don't attack what they're saying, they attack them. All of a sudden it's easier just to make the opponent look like a ding -a -ling, make him look incompetent. Right? My Lord. But I'll tell you, ministry is a tough place to be. You're